You know I love to bring on guests who can help us understand the economy, how to navigate it, and how to profit from it. And today we have got a great guest. I'm Kathy Fetke, and welcome to The Real Wealth Show. You're listening to The Real Wealth Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. Selma Hepp is the chief economist for CoreLogic, America's largest provider of advanced property and ownership information, analytics, and data-enabled services. Selma leads the economics team, which is responsible for analyzing, interpreting, and forecasting housing and economic trends in real estate, mortgages, and insurance. And she's here with us today on The Real Wealth Show. So Selma, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Kathy. I love having economists on because it is uh, so confusing out there. And everybody's got a different opinion about where the economy's headed, what the Fed's going to do, does it matter, how it's going to affect housing. So <laughs> what metrics do you look at uh, that that help you answer these questions? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think this, the signals are there out there are really mixed and I think it's really confusing to people. Um, the economy may be doing really well, but they are feeling the impacts of inflation and people are feeling mm -hmm. increasingly fatigued by that. And so when yes. you listen, you know, surveys after surveys asking people how they're doing, they, they feel like they're not doing well because of that. Um, so it, it is very confusing. And then when it comes to housing markets, I think it's confusing as well too, because, you know, rates are up, rates are down. <laughs> You know, is it is it a better market? Is it a worse market? You know, it's 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 very confusing to people, and it matters very much where you're sitting in the country. You know, some parts uh, of the country are doing better in terms of number of transactions and um, and just availability of inventory, where some other markets feel very frozen still. Um, and and so I think I can I can relate to that feeling of 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 confusion <laughs> out there. <laughs> So if the economy is doing well, you know, the GDP is up. Um, yeah. It's actually kind of average, right? It's not good, not bad. It's just pumping along. But if it, if the economy is doing well, who is that? Who's doing well? If when you do consumer surveys, the consumers and, and Americans are frustrated because they're paying more for everything. So who's doing well in this economy? Well, I think um, generally people that are faring better coming out of the pandemic are people are in higher income groups. Um, and, you know, the, when you look at what ha what's happened in the stock market over the last few years and the generation w wealth that was generated as a result, when you look at, you know, people's equity in their homes, you know, that's for a lot of people, um, the only wealth that they have, but, but it does feel better. Uh, because their wealth is up and, you know, for example, average homeowner has over $300,000 in equity, which is the highest that, that we've had. Um, so, so, you know, I, I think in terms of being in those that are employed, uh, those that maybe have gotten changed their jobs during the pandemic, because if they uh, changed their jobs, they tended to get a better income as a result. They get, they got a raise. So they may be feeling better. Um, I think that the issue is that those with fixed incomes, those that um, didn't get any income gains uh, coming out of the uh, pandemic um, are feeling these high prices of everything around them. Um, and so so I think, yes, in many ways, this is a, you know, the, the, our inequality um, issue got worsened probably as a result of how the pandemic played out. It certainly seems that way. But, you know, I've been saying this for 20 years that I've uh, been on the radio or having podcasts that if if you get into real estate, it grows with inflation. So if we experience inflation, you're going to kind of ride that wave versus not being on the shore or whatever, not ever getting on the wave. So, you know, this is kind of expected. Inflation isn't really new, is it? I mean, it's obviously been bad, but it's not new. Well, I mean, we've had inflation, um, you know, inflation is part of the economic growth, you know, for, for as economy grows, 
um, you, you, it's, you know, it, it's part of that is, is an inflation. The issue with more recent inflation is that it was, um, you know, we had a, a many, many years, you know, really when you think about it coming out of the 1980s, um, and into 1990s, we pretty much had a stable inflation since then. Um, and in some points in time, even felt like we were not having as much inflation as, as the, uh, economists would, would, would like to have. Um, and, and so I think that the shock of it is more an issue right now than the fact that, you know, people are not familiar with, um, 20, 30% inflation on some products that they buy regularly, you know, and so, you know, if we re remember last year, I think it was about eggs and then it's about, you know, gas prices are always up and down, but we are not used to seeing or feeling the inflation in food items as much as we did uh, over the last year or so, or a couple of years. The other thing is, you know, the, what, helped inflation leading up to the pandemic was that um, durable goods were increasingly produced abroad and the cost of production was lower there. And so things that we are used to spending, uh, you know, on durable goods, the prices on that, uh, on those items kept going down. So think about TVs, in many ways, autos as well. Um, you know, any uh, washer and dryers, you know, uh, furniture, anything you can think of that, that are big bulk items, those costs were coming down. But because we sort of uh, piled up on that during the pandemic, and now we wanted to get out and spend on other things, on services, for example, and, and eating out in restaurants and traveling and, and, you know, hair, you know, maybe not good example right now, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting ready for my hair appointment this week too. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, we wanted to, to, to consume services that uh we didn't consume dur during the pandemic and um the labor costs on those services increased so significantly coming out of the pandemic because we don't have as much we have a labor shortage in ma in many uh of those sectors of the economy now you're seeing those costs go up uh a lot right and and the other thing i think people are to some extent, feeling is that, you know, maybe some companies are um, raising prices beyond uh, what their own costs are and 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 their profits are growing. Um, and, and people, you know, generally it doesn't feel good. You know, it doesn't feel good when when you see, you know, cor uh, corporations doing so much better and, and then you're struggling with your own expenses. So I think that's part of it as well. Um, and um, so. You know, so, so I think it's, just, again, it's, it's more the more, most recent version of the uh, inflation, uh, that, that's bothering everybody. Yeah. So the bottom line is people who have been able to invest in stocks and real estate are benefiting from, yeah. um, from the last few years, but also from the last few decades. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's, it's not new. It's if you want to stay ahead, and like I said, get on, ride that wave instead of paddling hard yeah, to get yeah. on it. Um, and I have to use surf metaphors because we've had a great surf week here in California. <laughs> but, um, but you know, if if you don't, you could still make a lot of money um, and then spend that money on things that are costing more money. So if the, the sooner you can get your money into assets that inflate, the better, whatever it takes. This is just my advice to the audience. Like, don't do what Selma said. Don't spend it on restaurants and travel and so forth until you're on that wave. Life gets a lot easier once you have assets, once you own either stocks and real estate. Of course, I'm going to say real estate because we've seen it inflate for how many decades? It, right. You know, yeah, even, yeah. even during reset, even... Even in the 10 years where there might be a big recession, even the Great Recession, we see over time those values come back up even higher. Sure. So with that, a lot of people are scared right now mm -hmm. because real estate prices are so high. There's belief that if they're this high, they it's not sustainable. It's going to crash. Is that a possibility? Well, you know, there's always a possibility of a shock to the, to the economy. You know, we've seen that, you know, with the pandemic, that was just the, you know, the most 
obvious, you know, un, one of those unexpected, uh, huge shocks to the economy that, that really rattled, um, everything. So yes, you know, there is a possibility, but all the uh, housing fundamentals suggest that that's a very unlikely scenario. Uh, basically what, you know, I, I do agree that home prices, um, are growing, um, at seemingly pace that, that may, you know, seem unsustainable in many ways, given the how much mortgage rates have increased over the last year or so. But at the same time, we, you know, we started this conversation off with talking about how a resilient U.S. consumer is, how much more wealth people have. Um, and then also the fact that um, coming out of the Great Recession, we have not been building enough. So, you know, there are many estimates out there looking at uh, housing shortages in the U.S. and they average anywhere, you know, two to four to six million, depending on what estimate you're looking at. And in some markets that it, that undersupply is is much more significant. Um, and and so this that's really the driving factor behind a mortgage uh, behind home prices at the moment is just the fact that we have more buyers and we in fact have more buyers with cash and equity um and we don't have enough supply yeah so it's just mind boggling to me that there's still economists who are denying that and saying oh no be careful i mean i see them on i won't say which stations are on youtube but um who are just must be looking at something different than that because it's super obvious what's what's not been obvious is how many are uh, we're short of because like you said you'll you'll see some people say two million some say three i've i've heard 15 million i mean who knows uh but how could an economist say that you know th say that we're going to be flooded with housing like with you know things like um the silver tsunami all these yeah, you know yeah. people are going to die off you know is that <laughs> Well, yeah, no, I, I, you know, it's, it's a valid concern what happens down the road, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, we do know one thing we know for sure is that we're going to age. <laughs> I, hate the, I hate the part of uh, aging myself. It's not nice. <laughs> it is not nice. It's, it's very much not nice, but it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a reality. And so, so we know people will move on to, other things in, in this universe. And, and so, you know, <laughs> there remains the stock of housing that they, they previously occupied. The issue there is that, you know, um, we have, you know, still really large, uh, number of, uh, young adults and, and people being, you know, born into this country in addition to having a lot of Im immigration. Um, and, you know, I, I know the headlines are mostly about illegal immigration, but we've had a lot of legal immigration. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, in the latest CBO report, the immigration counts are up double from where, where we were historically. Historically, we get about a million and a half immigrants per year. Um, over the last couple of years, we got uh, over three million each year. Um, and so these each year. Oh. oh yeah, last couple of years, yeah. So so um now we're not expecting that level of immigration or immigration to to persist, but but okay, we had this additional three million people. Um I I'm adding a million and a half over the million and a half that we would have anyways. Uh, okay. It, yeah. Um so um, so, so we have a lot of people, right? We have a lot of people and we have a history of under, un, under supply. So even with folks, uh, you know, passing off, passing away and, and, and moving maybe to, to retirement homes or, or just, you know, uh, going away horizontally, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the rate of the, the additions, uh, is going to be really slow and gradual. So not, it's not a tsunami. It's maybe a tidal wave, you know, I've, I've heard people call it a tidal wave. So it's only a gradual addition to, um, to, to current, uh, number of homes available for sale or available for, for people to be living in. And, uh, you know, there, there was an estimate from Freddie that looked at, um, uh, this particular issue and, and they estimated over the next 10 year period, there's going to be a 9 million homes, uh, uh, coming on market as a result of, uh, um, baby boomers, uh, um, aging out of home ownership. And, 
you know, we just talked prior to this about the size of the housing shortage, which is significant. And, and so, you know, I, I'm more on a five to six million, uh, uh, in the five to six million range. And so, you know, with the nine million over a 10 year period, you know, it hardly feels like a a tsunami, right? It hardly feels like a, a shock. It, it it more feels like, in many ways, actually normalization in the housing market, um, because I think what we are experiencing right now, we had such a, a huge shock uh, to the housing market during the pandemic that appended all the uh, historic trends that we used to rely on, and so now we are, you know, it's hard to figure out what the actual new trend is. And um, but when we sort of take a really long look and say, okay, what is you know in a in an environment without shocks, what what should be the number of um, uh, home sales activity, number of homes available for sale, uh, the turnover in the housing market? We are only now slowly starting to return to those averages. Um, so, so I am, you know, so that's giving me in many ways confidence that we are not, um, in unsustainable environment. Yeah, it makes sense. Especially when people realize there's four to 5 million homes that trade every year that, that sell, uh, given the population of, of, um, millennials who want them. Yeah. I forget the number, but it's big. <laughs> do you do you know how many m- millennials? Well, there are about fifteen million millennials who are turning first time home buying age. Um, so yes, significantly 15, more fifteen million. Yeah, fifteen million uh-huh. turning home buying age, and we sell four to five million every year. Twenty five to thirty, I'll say twenty five percent tends to go to investors. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it's not like we're trying to sell 10 million homes every day to keep the market afloat. Um, there's, there's a, especially when you said immigration was an extra 3 million people, is that legal or combining illegal and legal? It's, it's combining both. It's combining okay. both, but we have ramped up in, uh, immigration of, uh, people on H1B visas, which are the working visas, um, and, and people that with specialty skills, you know, and, and we do need that. We need, we need w- one of the reason why inflation remains so persistent is that we have labor shortages in many sectors of the economy like one you know that relates that's very close to home is is construction um and so we we can use any help we can get um in terms of having more people constructing new homes hey i'm all for immigration we're a country of immigrants my you know most of our grandparents or great grandparents you know were immigrants my my grandparents were from denmark so it's it's uh of course we need more immigrants. I just wish it could be, you know, tracked and, and legal because I know so many people who've been here a long time who haven't been able to become legal uh, where they've been contributing. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother conversation. It is. It is. <laughs> uh, okay. So moving forward, what are some of the things we should be aware of that could turn the economy? You know, what, it doesn't take much to change supply and demand, right? You could you could kill demand, you could increase supply, something could happen. What should we be looking for and aware of? Well, one big thing that's a concern right now is what happens with inflation, uh, particularly as it relates to Federal Reserve's uh, tightening or, or loosening of monetary policy. And so, you know, we were... Uh, very, um, in- anxious to see, uh, uh, rate cuts, federal rate cuts, federal, uh, um, um, yeah. Fed, blinking Fed fund, up. Rate, Fed fund, yeah, Fed yeah. Fund rate cuts, right? And um, and and so clearly that's not, you know, so so the, the, that that uh, date keeps getting pushed out by the fact that we have, uh, you know, persistent inflation, and so and and some outside forces, some geopolitical forces now are having an impact as well on things like our gas prices, you know, and, and that always, you know, that never sits well with people to begin with, um, but let alone how it feeds into uh, prices of other items, right? Um, and so, 
you know, so I, I think right now really to me is, you know, what I, what I'm keeping a keen eye on is inflation, uh, because it does, it will have a determining impact on when we see that, uh, plane take off in a sense for the, for the housing market. You know, we're, we are sitting here in a, on a bottom in, in many ways and, and we're crawling our way out of it. And, and so, but lower mortgage rates will certainly help that. Um, so that's, that's a main one. You know, there's obviously, you know, the election, it's election year. So, so, you know, so that can sometimes be, keep people on hold in terms of some of the big decisions, such as buying a home. Um, you know, in, in some markets more so than others, but, but, you know, it is a very contested election. So, so you, you may, it's maybe having an impact on people, you know, mm -hmm. the other thing is, um, because of the, so, you know, in some ways, I, I feel like when you have more uncertainty or instability, um, geopolitically, that people tend to, uh, stay put, you know, they, they don't want to make any big decisions because they're worried how that, you know, those, those outside, um, outside events are going to, going to impact them. So, you know, it, it, there's a lot going on internationally. And, and so I, I think, uh, fortunately so far, it does seem like we are, um, faring okay. Um, and, and it's hasn't had a, a significant impact on our economy, but there could be, you know, something can, potentially happen and, and, and could have an impact on our economy. Um, the good thing is, you know, we, we have, you know, it does seem like we've managed a soft landing, um, meaning that we will not have a significant increase in unemployment due to these uh, tighter financial conditions and uh, companies are holding on to their employees. And in, in many ways, it's turned out in as best as it could have, you know, so, so, so the outlook for the economy is really sort of positive, you know, we're going to continue humming along. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, with time and with inflation coming down and people's wages growing faster than inflation, you'll see the real incomes increase and people will, um, st start being happier again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, very good. Um, now, a lot of our listeners, this is the final question, I promise. Um, a lot of our listeners are uh, landlords, they own single family rentals, uh, or multifamily. It sounds like if if there are people sitting on the fence or kind of priced out of the market, they would be um, forced to rent, right? Do you see the rental market continuing to be strong to with um, rents continuing to rise? Well, certainly, I, I do think that a rental market and for no, you know, if 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 it wasn't just for home prices, but also the fact that we are, you know, we have more demand and the pent up demand is so much stronger than than available supply. So and people like to, you know, when particularly in times, as I just described, of uncertainty and, and uh, you know, young adults like to test out markets. So they may, in fact, try to rent first before uh, buying in a certain market uh, if they can, in fact, afford in those markets. But, you know, we have a um, data series uh, on single family rentals. And in our data, uh, the most recent uh, rent growth has started to accelerate again, which is not necessarily good for inflation, but it speaks to the continued demand or the persistent demand for for rental for rental market, especially uh, the the that detached type of housing, because it's um, you know as I mentioned, millennials, the, the, this large cohort of population is growing older and they need more space. And so in that sense, this, the single family detached homes are uh, more preferred uh, by that by that group. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that um, the demand for rental is going to remain solid. Well, Selma, thank you so much for joining me yeah. here on The Real Wealth Show. We'd love to have you come out to speak at one of our events sometime. Absolutely. It would be my pleasure. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. If you want more information specifically on different markets in the U.S. where you can find real estate that still cash flows and has a great potential of growing because there's a lot of growth happening in the market, just go to realwealthshow.com. When you click on the Invest tab, you will see the different markets that we think still offer a great opportunity. 
And you can speak with one of our very experienced investment counselors that can help you find investment property in those markets that come with property management in place. All right. Thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. And we'll see you next time. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.